jury, this is a simple case. A simple case of this defendant, Noah Raekwon Williams, and his clever attempt to defy the law and arm himself with a gun. A simple case of this defendant using his girlfriend, Antoinette Bryant, to purchase something that he cannot because he is a convicted felon. A simple case of this defendant not being able to rid himself of one thing, his DNA. On March 4th of 2021, officers with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office who were assigned to what is called the task force were doing their normal training duties. And you'll learn during the course of trial that the task force is groups of officers. And there is a group of officers in that task force throughout each zone without, within the city. You're going to hear specifically from officers from two task forces, the zone one and zone five. Now, Officer Peppers and Officer Ledger will tell you that at that time in March, because these two zones border one another, they often worked in tandem to help each other with traffic stops. They're tasked with proactively policing, which includes doing routine traffic stops. On that specific night around 7 p.m., Officer Peppers was patrolling in his zone driving down MLK Parkway. He observed a white Toyota Corolla traveling and starting to exceed the speed limit. So this caught his attention. He does routine traffic stops. He watched as that vehicle kind of started to weave in and out of traffic. But before Officer Peppers could get close enough to initiate a traffic stop, turn on his emergency lights indicating he wants them to pull over, the car started to move from zone one into zone five. So at that point, Officer Peppers gets on the radio and he calls for assistance from Officer Ledger, a zone five task force officer. Officer Ledger picks up where Officer Peppers leads off. He too watches as that white Toyota Corolla is speeding down MLK Parkway and weaving in and out of traffic. Officer Ledger will tell you that at that time of night, the traffic was pretty heavy. And as that Corolla is weaving in and out of traffic, other cars are having to maneuver out of the way. So Officer Ledger gets behind the car, he turns on his emergency lights indicating that he wants them to pull over, and they do. Now, you're not just going to hear from officers today, you're actually going to get to watch their interactions. At that time in March of 2021, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office had equipped each of their officers with a body-worn camera. And the officers are going to explain to you that that camera is worn on the center of their chest and that there is a button that activates. You'll learn that that activation um, triggers the audio and video to begin recording. It actually rewinds 30 seconds, so there will be 30 seconds of silence initially before the audio begins to pick up. Now, I want to temper your expectations. This is not a cameraman standing, catching every single detail. Your view on that body-worn camera is from the officer's chest level. So you're going to see what they see in front of them. But what you will hear is their complete interactions with everyone in that car. Officer Ledger gets out of his car after the car pulls over, and he walks up to the driver's side where he starts to talk to the driver, Antonisha Bryant. And you'll also hear him and see him start to talk to the backseat passenger directly behind Ms. Bryant. Shaheen Murphy. Officer Ledger is doing what he always does in a routine traffic stop and just trying to gather information about who the driver is, who else is in the car. At that same time, Officer Peppers has now joined up with Officer Ledger and he walks up to the passenger side. And he'll tell you two reasons for that. The traffic is pretty heavy. You'll actually hear and see as cars are zipping by during this traffic stop. But also, Officer Peppers walks up to that passenger side because they don't know who's in the they don't know how many people are in the car. So his job is to just kind of maintain and see what's happening on the passenger side of the vehicle while Officer Ledger identifies who the driver of this car is. Officer Peppers walks up, and inside on the passenger side in the front seat is this defendant, Noah Williams. His seat's kind of laid back. He's got his COVID mask on, and his window is up. Officer Peppers just kind of knocks on the window, asks him for his ID. Again, all routine stuff, just trying to identify who's in that car. Another officer, Officer Zins, who is also a Zone 1 Task Force officer, pulls up to assist. 
he kind of picks up where Officer Ledger leaves off. So Officer Ledger walks back to his car, and he starts to run the names just to find out who he's dealing with. Officer Zinson starts to talk to Miss Bryant, the driver, and he says, hey, do you mind if we search your car? Her response, sure, no problem. So at that point, what Officer Zins will explain to you is when a search is conducted of a car, they have to get everybody out. The people can't stay in while the search is conducted. She's given permission. So everybody is asked to get out of the car. Officer Zins will also explain to you that just for safety of everyone at that traffic stop, there is a request, hey, can we patch you down, make sure you don't have any weapons. You'll hear that Antonisha Bryant is patted down by female officer. Male officers do not do that pat down. And Shaheen Murphy, he's asked, can we patch down the weapon? Sure, no problem. Officer Zins pats him down. Hey, man, can I reach in your pocket? Sure, no problem. Officer Peppers then engages with the defendant, and he doesn't have the same attitude. But he is patted down anyways. And Officer Peppers will explain to you the reason for that is because he is about to send three people back with another officer. It's for their safety. He is using his open hands just to pat down to be sure that the defendant doesn't have any, anything that could be dangerous and could escalate this situation. It is nothing more than that. So the three of them are sent back to stand with another officer as this search of the vehicle is done. <coughs> now, Officer Zins has already been alerted by Antonisha Bryant that there is a firearm in the glove box. Her so you will see as Officer Peppers begins to put on latex gloves, another officer walks up, Officer Aldridge, and he has on cotton gloves, and he starts to reach for the glove box, and Officer Peppers stops him and tells him, we don't, we don't use those kind of gloves. We have to use latex gloves. At this point, Officer Peppers doesn't know what this traffic stop is going to be, so he is being better safe than sorry. There may be evidence here, there may not be evidence here, and you can't collect evidence with cloth gloves because it could contaminate it. So Officer Pepper stops him, tells him, we don't, we don't touch possible evidence with that, we have to preserve it for DNA or prints. The glove box is open and the officers just kind of peek in. You'll see them shine their flashlight just to see what's in that glove box. They don't touch anything, they don't manipulate anything at this point. Officer Peppers looks in, and you'll actually see his view. Um, and what he sees is there are two firearms in the glove box, and they are separated from their respective magazines. What you'll learn is in that glove box is a Glock with an extended magazine and a Beretta with a standard magazine. But initially, Officer Peppers looks in there, and he mistakes the Beretta for a Smith & Wesson. So in his mind, he is alerted that Miss Bryant says she has one gun in there. So he goes back to talk to her. What kind of gun did you say you have? And she replies, a Glock and a Beretta. So Officer Pepper says, well, what about the Smith & Wesson? Immediately. I, I don't know the Smith & Wesson. At that point, members of the jury, you will watch as this defendant leans over. You got a Smith & Wesson, too. And Miss Bryant, oh, oh, I have a Smith & Wesson, too. Miss Bryant was going to own whatever guns were found in that car because he told her to. Officer Peppers, knowing that this defendant is prohibited from carrying firearms, detains him, places him in handcuffs, and places him in the back of the vehicle so that they can now truly begin their investigation. Those firearms have just become the subject of an investigation. You will see as Officer Peppers, who has now touched the defendant with those gloves, removes them before he goes back up to that car. You'll see his hands. So you'll see his bare hands when he returns up there. Officer Peppers then goes through um, some very specific procedures to collect those guns. You'll see as he walks to the trunk of his car, and you'll see this from two views. You'll see it from Officer Zinn's view as well as Officer Peppers' view. And you'll see as he grabs two pairs of gloves and two brown paper bags. One pair of gloves for one gun and its accompanying magazine, one pair of gloves for the other gun and its accompanying magazine, and the same for those bags, keeping them separate. You'll watch as Officer Peppers and Officer Zins go up and they start to collect. 
You'll see him take his body cam off and he will show exactly what is in that glove box. You'll see for yourself that these guns are in the glove box together and the magazines are separated from the guns. Officer Peppers will then meticulously take each one, read off their serial number and place it in the bag, remove the first pair of gloves to collect the second firearm. Doing all of this to ensure that any future testing is not damaged in any way. Now, you'll ultimately hear that the defendant is let go that evening. He is not arrested. The investigation has to continue. Detective Daigle with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office was tasked with doing some extra research. So at that traffic stop, we have Antoinette Bryant claiming ownership of whatever guns were in that car. First she says it's the Glock and the Beretta, then she thinks they're the Smith and Wesson, she's going to own that too. So Detective Daigle researches, and what he finds out is that she is the owner of just that Glock firearm. She purchased it from GT Distribute. GT Distributors on November 4th of 2020 for just over $300. You will also hear that at some point during that traffic stop, the brother of Shaquille Murphy, that backseat passenger, he came up and he also claimed ownership for that brother. So Detective Daigle did a little bit of research and what he found is that Rashad Murphy is in fact the owner of that Beretta firearm. Detective Daigle also collected DNA swaps from Antonisha Bryant and Rashad Murphy, and another detective collected the DNA of this defendant. Those DNA swaps are ultimately sent off to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for someone else to do the testing. So those swaps along with the four swaps from the guns. And you're going to hear from Scott Watzlewick, who did the swapping of that. So Scott Watzlewick has a very lengthy career in law enforcement, but at some point he decides that he's going to focus on a more unique area, the swabbing of guns. And he'll explain to you that that process that he went through to a be trained on it is very similar to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and also he will explain how he swabs and where he swabs. He is swabbing the places on a gun that are most likely to be touched by an individual hand. After Scott Watzlewick does his swabbing of one swab for the gun, one swab for the magazine, and same for the breath, one swab for the gun, one swab for the magazine. Those swabs are packaged and they are sent to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for further testing. After Mr. Watzlewick does his investigation, that gun is, both of those guns are then sent to the latent print unit with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. And you're going to hear from Shalonda Adams. Ms. Adams was tasked with reviewing the work of another examiner in this case. She will explain to you that a latent print is a chance impression. She is looking to see if there are any prints on mostly the smooth surfaces because that's where we would most likely see a print. And not uncommonly, she found no latent prints on either of the guns. Now, Detective Deagle's research into this defendant led him to another fact. What he found is that this defendant is a rapper. Spinnabens is the name that he goes by. Now, Detective Deagle found some interest in one song that he has. That song was released on November 28th of 2020. That is an important date for you to remember. And you all are going to have the opportunity to hear the song for yourself, but what Detective Deagle will tell you is that the lyrics of that song, the important lyrics, are this defendant saying, my block costs $300. He later in the song says, oh, she 18, give that bitch 302. Tell her it's lit, we need some 47, six, twos, and nines. Coincidence? 24 days after Antoinette Bryant purchases a block, this defendant is rapping about his block costing $300. He's rapping about giving money to a female to buy things that he can't. That's for you to decide. The last witness that you're going to hear from is Jeannie Linadonna, who works for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. She has been in the biology department for over 15 years, and her area of expertise is DNA. Ms. Adana will explain to you the process that she goes through um, to receive swabs, how they are packaged, the importance of her testing environment to ensure that there is no sort of contamination. Uh, she will explain to you the process that she goes through to test 
a swab from a piece of evidence against a swab from a known individual, which, again, we have those three swabs. Antonisha Bryant, Rashad Murphy, and this defendant, Noel Williams. Ms. Adana will tell you that as far as the Glock magazine, the Beretta firearm, and the Beretta magazine go, she got results. But those results, unfortunately, were mixtures that were not interpretable. There was too much of a mixture on those firearms for her to take those individual swaps and compare them. And in some instances, there was just not enough DNA for her to do anything with it. But what she will tell you is that that Glock firearm, that also had a mixture. But it was a mixture that she could interpret. She was able to compare swaps to that mixture. Ms. Adana was able to determine that there were three donors, one unknown, one Antonisha Bryant, and the third contributor, this defendant, Noah Williams. Members of the jury, this is a very simple case. And the state will stand before you at the close of this case, and we will ask that you use your common sense. That is your greatest asset when you go back in that room to deliberate. We will ask that you use your common sense in considering the evidence. We are confident that you will find a verdict that is